how light and darkness are really the great polarity, right? You could say spirit and nature, spirit and matter to begin with, then light and darkness, then the warm side of the color circle, yellow, orange, reddish, the cool side, right? Violet, blue, green. Even green can have a, a re relative to another green can be warm or cool, right? Same with the red. Within the realm of red, there are cool and warm sides. Right? So this is just a diagram to help us orientate ourselves, just in the pure logic, right? Uh, how light and light and darkness express through white and black, they can mingle, mingle to create a gray, and they can mix to create a green, these sides of yellow and blue. Right? Yellow and blue, we know from all of our life's experiences that these two colors are, are like what actually would create nature. So we're going to go in a little bit deeper uh, to you know, try to understand how Goethe came to this great polarity of yellow and blue. We're going to do that in a few minutes. Very important is this word enhancement, or um, there are several other good words, um, intensification, right? It's speaking about how the warm side and the cool side of the color circle become something higher, a new principle. And that's where the red then uh, is born, if you will, between the uh, warm and the cool, how uh, they find a culmination, right? A heightening into pure red. You could even say, uh, from a spectral point of view, magenta, pure red, purpur, not purple, but purpur. That's, the, I think, the German word for magenta. And I've written it here, purpur. P-U-R, P-U-R. That's what the cat does. It's also pur, pur. <laughs> um, that would be a nice name for a cat, magenta. <laughs> Just a suggestion. So, is it, is it, are there any questions about that? It's, I think, very clear. Uh, systematic diagram just as a help to orientate ourselves. Okay, we're, we're going to talk about color in the first instance and then move over to what is Mazur, right? What is Mazur painting? Uh, of course, tonight only more conceptual presentation, tomorrow a mixture of the conceptual and the practical hands on. So if there are any questions along the way, please interrupt me. Um, I thought that we could just back away from this and listen to a few words again from Steiner. Because it, it's, it's exhibit, he exhibits very early on, you know, Steiner, uh, the pedagogical, cultural implication of color. The first time, I don't know, maybe some of you are thinking, when was the first time he really spoke about color? Um, naturally, in, in uh, theosophy, he speaks quite a lot about the aura of a human being. Right? There's about 10, 11 pages. Uh, a little bit later, of course, are the, is the book here where he, he speaks about uh, color, and particularly peach blossom which we'll actually speak about tonight, too. But I'm going to read um, something that was written, in, written, not lectured on, uh, 1907, Education of the Child in the Light of Anthroposophy, is how it's translated. <clears throat> um, this is part of what he's making a presentation about a new education. 1907. Okay. He says, a nervous 
That is to say, an excitable child should be treated differently as regards environment from one that is, who is quiet and lethargic. That was us. We were either excitable or lethargic when we were young, right? I was lethargic. Everything comes into consideration from the color of the room and the various objects that are generally around the child to the color of the clothes in which he or she is dressed. One will often do the wrong thing if one does not take guidance from spiritual knowledge. We have to kind of trust that for a moment. For in many cases, the materialistic idea will hit on exactly the verse of what is right. Isn't that true? An excitable child should be surrounded by and dressed in the red or reddish yellow colors. Whereas for a lethargic child, one should have a recourse to a blue or bluish green shades of color. For the important thing is the complementary color, which is created within the child. In the case of red, it is green. And in the case of blue, orange, yellow, as may easily be seen by looking for a time at a red or blue surface, and then quickly directing one's gaze to a white surface. The physical organs of the child create a contrary or complementary color. And it is this which brings about the corresponding organic structures that the child needs. If the excitable child has a red color around him, he will inwardly create the opposite, the green. And this activity of creating green has a calming effect. Organs assume a tendency to calmness. Very interesting, right? So we'll go into you know what is what does that mean? The complementary color. Uh, it may not be exactly the same strength of color. If you have a red, powerful red, it's not going to be a powerful green. It's going to be something different. So in the workshop, uh, we'll do an experiment too. Um, Goethe calls this complementary uh, physiological complementary. So this is, I think, what Will Steiner is pointing to that in the organs, in the physiology of the child, the green is working in a very subtle way. I'm calling. If it's a red surrounding or red clothing, that the green is working inward. You've done this experiment, which we'll do tomorrow, um, where you looked at a red spot or some red object and seen uh, a sort of magical green, right? Okay, we'll do that. So that, I wanted to just bring that up out because that is, uh, of course, the beginning of what will become a cultural direction for uh, Rudolf Steiner and those who were the first ones to work with him. <clears throat> Out of the spiritual life of anthroposophy, a sea of culture must be created <clears throat> in order for a new style in architecture with new forms, colors, of course, to develop. An expression of humanity is only possible where there is a common culture of the spirit. The warehouse style architecture meets the needs of the utilitarian thinking of materialism. Inherent in elements of culture is the potential to be formed in such a way that they are much more educational than they are today. The spirit life in all things can come to expression and create new forms only when we feel that we are surrounded by the expression of the soul. As was the case in the Middle Ages, for example, only then will we be able to find the right path to Tao. This is only possible if culture streams permeate human life as described by spiritual science and philosophy. Spiritual science is not impractical and permeates all culture or can permeate all culture. Neither does it only exist in abstract thoughts but rather it should float 
the water element into different cultural streams, and it should be evident in everything. I think that I, I, I concur with Robert and Chuck that the workshops are really important because they, uh, there's something that happens in a workshop that you can't convey in a, in a book. Sounds, sounds about right, huh? When you have the you know, real life experience, it goes deeper than just thoughts. So, um, I wanted to now work with the color circle. We were speaking about the, the yin yang and how these are the great polarities of existence. Uh, the first principle of the Tao is wholeness, oneness. Everyone knows that. Sounds a little bit like Goethe, right? Already. Wholeness. Do we consider the leaf first, or do we consider the tree? Do we consider the finger of a human being, or the human being as a totality, right? First. Um, the same with the colors. That, you know, we were going to consider the whole family, brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles and cousins, of color, right? That all the colors are a large family, you say. If we spoke about yellow as being that color, which is one of the I could use watercolor, but I chose for the sake of not splashing water all over Bert's rug here. Right? <laughs> Didn't want to get the plates messed up too quickly. Uh, these are just indications. I'm not going to be able to get a real powerful yellow yet. And um, how does yellow arise? Because, well, let's see if there's anyone uh, who has worked a little bit with Goethe's color lessons um, can tell us. It's a darkening of the light. Right. It's a darkening of the light. Is that, is that difficult to grasp? A darkening of the light. In the sense that yellow is is born out of this dynamic between light and dark and a little bit of shading of light or darkening, if you will, creates the yellow. When you look at the sun, right, in a bright lit sun, um, spherical shape, and there's a little bit of atmosphere Maybe in the morning, right? A little bit of atmosphere. The sun does appear a little bit yellowish, right? And then, of course, a little bit more atmosphere strengthens, intensifies. The color becomes a little bit more orangey, so on. So you get the idea. All right, so let's, just for the sake of a diagrammatical presentation here, show how a strong light will create this yellow. You can see how, even in my poor effort here, that the yellow quite easily takes on independence out of that light. So of course all of this can fall around. Okay, on the other side, would you like to continue and tell us about darkness and what color arises out of darkness? Purple. Perhaps. Is it is it purple? It's blue. I mean, purple, of course, is a dark uh, hue, color, but 
it has warmth in it. And so we want a color that is closest to darkness, but not yet warm. So how would we say that blue arises? Lumen darkness. darkness. You bring light into the darkness. So imagine a pitch black space in your imagination uh, to begin with and how the beginning of light and how blue may arise out of that. Cool blue or sort of middle blue may. So this here, uh, I don't know if we have any, we don't have any water. That's okay. Sometimes I like to wet the board just to accentuate.